Hello everyone and welcome to another Endgame episode with Coach B and MasterChess.com. In this video we're going to take a look at some basic Knight Endgames. Now Knight and Pawns versus Knight and Pawns are definitely not trivial Endgames. They are quite difficult. However, there are some basic positions that are not that difficult to understand, especially if you're in the 16 to 1800 level. So as we are still in the 1600 to 1800 level in our beginner to master course, I decided to put this video together. And before getting into those common positions, I want to do a quick recap of some important information about the knights. First of all, we know that knights take a long time to go from one side of the board to the other side of the board. And the best square to be near a knight without being threatened to be attacked is diagonally with one square in between. As you can see here, the black king is one square diagonally from the knight. It will take the knight three moves to attack that square. For example, the knight would have to go to something like b3, to d4, to f5 to check the black king. And yes, there are many other paths, but all of them will take three moves to attack the square e7. Also, the king being one square diagonally away from the knight, takes control of some very important squares from the knight. If the knight would try to go to the square h8, he would have a hard time doing that because the king attacks the square d7 and e6 and the knight cannot step on those squares. And even if the knight would go to something like e4, now the king also takes control of the squares d6 and f6. So you could see the knight would have to go around to reach that square. If he would go to g5, now he doesn't have control of the squares e6 and f7. So you could see that this is a really great position for the black king. On the other side of the board, I also want to mention that the square right next to the knight on the opposite color, it will also take the knight two moves to attack that square. So there is no immediate forks. So you could see here the white king is on g3. For the knight to attack that square, it will take him two moves. It could go, for example, to g1 and then to e2, checking the white king. Or another path could be d4 to f5. So there are many options, but all of them will take two moves to attack the white king. So you know that there will not be any immediate forks if you are next to a knight. And you will see why this is important information in the next couple of examples that we're going to take a look at. So let's get started. The first two positions we're going to take a look at, it's going to involve a forced knight exchange due to a winning pawn endgame. In all knight endgames, you will always want to be aware of the potential outcome of the pawn endgame if those knights are exchanged. That is the easiest way to win these type of positions. So here, with white to move, if you analyze this pawn endgame, you could see that white has the potential of creating an outside pass pawn with the move h5. This will give white the winning advantage. Therefore, the easiest way to win this game is knight to c4 check, forcing a trade, and after the knight captures on c4 and king captures on c4, after king to c7 and h5, you can see that black is not inside the square of the pass pawn that's created on the h file. After g takes h5, g takes h5, the king is too short and he's not going to catch the other pawn from promoting, therefore white will win the game. In this next position, if we analyze the pawn structure, we can see that here white has a winning pawn endgame due to the fact that he has a protected pass pawn on g5. Therefore, black's king is always going to have to stay near that pawn because if that pawn promotes to g6, he has to be able to enter the square of the pawn to stop it before it promotes. Therefore, the easiest way to win this endgame is forcing a knight exchange with the move knight to b4 check. After this, black only has two options. If he doesn't want to exchange the knight, then he makes a king move, king to d6. Well, here, white will simply capture the knight on c6. After the king captures the knight, after g6, the black king cannot enter the square of the pawn. And that pawn will promote, giving white an easy winning endgame. Coming back from the beginning after knight to b4, if black does exchange a knight, let's say knight takes on b4, after a takes b4, white has a winning endgame. After something like king to d6, king to d2, king to e6, king to c3, king to e7, king to d4, king to d6 taking the opposition, also staying near the square of the pawn. Well here, white can simply march the pawn on g6, converting this pawn endgame into a fox and a chicken type of game. So after g6, king to e6, pawn to g7, king to f7, king to e5, after black takes the pawn on g7, 
the king will take the pawn on f5, leading into a winning endgame. This game could continue with something like king to f7, king to e5, king to e7, king to d5. I'm now I'm just going to fast forward through the best continuation and you will see that black is behind and he's not going to be able to stop white from promoting his pawn and then white will win the game. Next we're going to take a look at the positions where we have a knight and pawn versus knight and the pawn is on the 7th rank. For these positions, if the pawn is on one of the center files and the white king works together with the knight, he can win this game. Even if the opponent was able to bring the king and the knight to cover the promotion square. So in this position, the correct play is knight to d7, covering the promotion square with the knight and also covering the square f6. After this, black is in zook swan. He cannot move the knight as the pawn will promote with check, therefore he has to move the king. So after something like king to h6, the knight will come to f6. And now the knight is challenged, he cannot move the knight away as the pawn will promote. He cannot move the knight to f8 as the king will simply take the knight and then promote the pawn. So here the best he's got is to take the knight, but the pawn will promote on the next move anyways. And coming back from the beginning, I do want to mention that after knight to d7, we looked at the king going to h6, but no better is king to g6 defending the pawn, because after knight to f8 check, if black doesn't capture the knight, white will simply capture the knight and promote the pawn on the next move, and if black does capture the knight, the, the white king will simply take it and then move away to e8 and promote the pawn. This next position is very similar to the previous position. The only difference is that black covers the promotion square from g6 with the knight instead of from the square h7. But the play will be very similar. You could see that white has the knight on d7 covering the promotion square f8, also covering the square f6. And now it's white to move as the white king is in check, so he's going to move the king to e8. And after this, black cannot prevent white from winning this game. He cannot move the knight as the pawn will promote with check, so he's going to have to move the king. And he has no good squares for the king. If he goes on h7, well, well here white will simply move the knight to f8 check, forcing a trade, and after knight takes f8, king takes f8, king to h8, the king will simply have to move away, and then white will promote the pawn and win the game from here. Coming back, if the king moves to h6 instead, well after knight to e5, there's not much that black can do. If he takes the knight on e5, he's simply going to promote the pawn with check, and then he's going to win the game from here. And coming back, if black is not going to take the knight on e5, but he's going to make a king move, let's say king to g7, well after white will take the knight on g6, king, king takes g6, white will still promote the pawn and win the game. And coming back, no better is king to h8, because here white will still move the knight to e5, and, and then the same play is going to be achieved. If black takes the knight, the pawn will promote with check. And if black is not going to take the knight, then he's going to move the king. Well, after white captures the knight, the pawn will still promote. In this next position, white also has a pawn on the 7th rank on one of the center files. However, his knight is far away, and here black is able to achieve a draw. The correct play for black is knight to c8 check. Here, if white takes the knight, obviously black will simply take the queen and a draw has been reached. So here he has to play something different. He's going to have to move the king. If he moves the king to e6, well after this the knight will move to b6, attacking the pawn. If the pawn promotes to a queen, black will simply take it and a draw has been achieved. So here white will need to move the king and he's going to move the king to e7. Well after that, black will simply take the pawn and a draw has been achieved. And coming back from the beginning after knight to c8 check, if the king moves to e8 instead, well here, knight is going to move to d6 with check. King to e7, knight to c8. And white cannot make any progress. If he tries something different, let's say he's going to move the king to e6. Well now, black all he needs to do is move the king to d8, stopping that pawn from marching. After something like knight to e3 and knight to b6, that pawn is being attacked and there's nothing that white can do to prevent black from sacrificing his knight achieving a draw. After knight to d5, the knight will simply take on d7, achieving a draw. This next position, it's a little bit different as it involves a rook pawn. Due to the fact that knights have a really hard time attacking pawns on the side of the board, the correct play here is a beautiful knight sacrifice, knight to d4 check. After this, black will take the knight on d4 and now king to f6, 
a square diagonally away from the knight, take, taking control of the squares e6 and f5. As you will see, black is going to have a really hard time to try to sacrifice the knight for the pawn and white will win the game. After something like knight to c2, pawn to h5. Knight to e3, king to g5. Again, covering the squares f5 and g4, stopping the knight from going close to the pawns or attacking the square in front of the pawn. After knight to c4, pawn to h6, knight to e5, pawn to h7, and now Black is going to move the knight to f7, the only square available to cover the promotion square. But after the white king attacks the knight, the knight is forced to move to h8. And after king to g7, there's absolutely nothing that black can do to stop white from taking the knight and then promoting his pawn. After a simple knight to f7, the white king will take the pawn, king to c6, and the pawn promotes. This next position, it's white to move. And this position is a little bit more challenging. But I want to encourage you to pause the video and try to think about how would you play this position and then press resume when you have an idea. All right, assuming that you've thought about this position, I'm going to go ahead and talk about the correct play. So if we look at this position, we could see that white's only hope for winning this position is if he could promote the pawn on g6, as it's only two squares away from promoting. Therefore, he definitely has to make sure that he does not allow black to attack any of those two squares. So here the correct play is knight to e7, clearing the path of the pawn to march forward. After this, black responds with knight to d7. And you could see that the black knight is heading for the square f6 to cover the promotion square. Well, after knight to c6 check, attacking the king, the king will move to b6. And now an excellent move by white, knight takes on e5. What this move does is challenges the knight on d7 to move. If black takes the knight on e5, well now after pawn to g7, black is not able to reach the square g8 anymore and that pawn will promote. And coming back, if black moves the knight to f6 to cover the promotion square, well after knight to d7 check, black is forced to take the knight. After knight takes d7, another excellent move, pawn to e5. What this move does, it covers the square f6, which is the only move that the knight needs to cover the promotion square. If if the knight steps on that square now, well the pawn on e5 will take the knight on f6 and then will promote one of the pawns. If black takes the pawn on e5, the pawn will march to g7 and same scenario, black is not able to reach the square g8. And the last try that black has is knight to f8, but after pawn to g7 and knight to g6, the pawn will promote and white will win this game. And this last position that I want to cover is definitely not a trivial position, but I believe that is very instructive. Here it's black to move, and obviously black is trying to promote the pawn on d4, as that's the only pass pawn that he has, while white is going to try to prevent that. So here the correct play is moving the pawn to d3, now that pawn is only two squares away from promoting. Here the best try for white to achieve a draw is moving the king to f1, getting inside the square of the pawn. Uh, coming back, I do want to mention that knight to b5, it's not going to work as the only square that will cover the promotion square is on c3, which the black knight covers it. So after d2 and knight to c3 check, trying to cover promotion square, black is simply going to take the knight and then promote the pawn. So this is definitely not the way to go. So coming back, king to f1 was played. And now a very important move by black, knight to c3. What this move does it takes away the square b5 from the white knight, which is the square that his knight needs to use to try to get closer to the pawn and attack it. You can see also the black king covers the square d6. So white is going to have a little bit of trouble coming with the knight to attack the pawn. So from here, white responded with king to e1, coming closer to the pawn. After this, king to d4, and now king to d2, from which black responded with knight to e4 check, and then king to c1. And now another beautiful move here by black. Pause the video if you want to see what you would play here. All right, and this is definitely not an easy move to find, but the correct play here is knight to d6, an excellent move. What this move does is repositions the knight to a more favorable position while also maintaining control of the square b5 and preventing white's knights to come into the game. And after this, white responded with king to d2, then knight to c4 check, king to c1, pawn to d2 check king to c2, king to e3, and now the knight comes to b5. After knight to a3 check, 
white is in Zook's one and black will win the game. If white captures the knight on a3, well after king to e2 there's not much that white can do to stop that pawn from moving forward as he cannot cover the promotion square. So after something like knight to b1 the pawn will promote with check and black will win the game. And coming back if white does not take the knight but he's going to move the king let's say king to d1. Well after black takes the knight on b5 white is again lost and black will win the game. Alright then that concludes the lesson for today. Thank you so much for watching this video. And I hope that seeing this video will give you some more tools to put in your toolbox, especially when you reach these type of positions. Even though the play in these type of positions is not that trivial, I am hopeful that seeing this video will help you look for these strategies and apply them in your games. And that concludes our night versus night endgames. If you liked my video, please subscribe and don't forget to check out my new website, MasterYourChess.com where you can learn, practice, test, and master your chess knowledge.